All right. Uh, thanks for coming back. Um, next speaker is um, Feng Xu Sun from USC. He's professor of uh, molecular and computational uh, biology and mathematics. Um, He's, uh, his, his work is essentially in genomic analysis, but writ very uh, broadly over a full range of, of topics in uh, genomic analysis. He has worked with Michael Waterman and uh, others at the foundations of, of uh, genomic analysis. But the, uh, one of the things that uh, aligns him well with uh, some of the stuff that's going on here is he's worked on alignment-free statistics and other issues uh, associated with uh, genomic and metagenomic uh, comparison. And so today uh, he'll tell us about, uh, in, in keeping with the massively interacting systems world, uh, the uh, metagenomic analysis. And um, uh, I really feel like, I just want to say that this, this, this continuation of this theme in such different topics as being uh, relevant across them is is, uh, is, is really uh, compelling and interesting, and I'm, I really am happy that uh, Dr. Sun is able to uh, be with us today. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the introduction, and thanks for Christine for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to present our work. Yesterday, I uh, talked to Chris and saw his great vision for the Institute, and I hope that I can contribute a little bit to this great effort. And I also talked to several other investigators from Virginia Tech, as well as from this Institute, like Stephen Eubeck. And actually, Stephen and I, we had some quite overbeat uh, left uh, overlap, in particular for the NIH MIDAS program, that's the modeling of infection diseases. And also another grant, uh, the, it's on the National Science Foundation for the algorithm for threat detection. So, okay, so the title of my talk is Statistical and Computational Approaches for the identification of novel viruses and the virus host interaction. And here is the outline of my talk. First, I will give a brief introduction about metagenomics. Then I will see uh, a method for identifying new viruses in the metagenomics data. Once we identify those viruses and we try to predict the host of these viruses, that's the viral host matter. To answer the second question, we will use alignment-free approaches to compare those virus sequences and uh, bacterial sequences. So we introduce two new statistics, D2 star and D2S, that we have been working on for almost 10 years. And we have found many great applications for this applying. Uh, alignment-free method. Uh, if I have time, I will talk about other software tools for metagenomic analysis that we developed in our group. Uh, first, I will begin some introduction about metagenomics. Uh, as most of you already know, that metagenomics is a super hot field. Uh, I would say that you could not go without hearing some exciting news in the months about metagenomics. Uh, just this week, uh, you probably heard about uh, uh, the Nature published uh, the International Earth Microbiome Project. And then last week, there are some big news from uh, two or four papers from Nature and Science about the microbiome effect, the uh, cancer therapy. And if you have certain uh, bacteria in your microbiome, and then you, the cancer chemo treatment might be quite effective, give, get, give you effect, uh, efficacy of 80%. But if you don't have that particular bacteria, the efficacy is probably just 30%. So that shows the importance of those bacteria. Just visiting this month again, 
we saw science published the human microbiome project, the second phase of human microbiome project, and it contains the shotgun sequencing of close to 300 individuals at different locations of the human body. So you can see that the microbial uh, get into the uh, everywhere. It get into the earth and get into the ocean and get into the human body and etc. Uh, another important aspect of the uh, microbiome is that you can control it, and so because it's the environmental factor, and so you can see that you, let's say if it relate to the human gut, you can do fecal transplant. And then you can see, okay, so if this is really related to a particular uh, the bacteria, and in particular, such as the IBD and the Crohn's disease, and you might uh, change the focus microbiome by the health people, and then you try to see whether uh, that will uh, change the response or change the phenotype of the individuals. And we are collaborating with the scientists in the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles on this particular project. Uh, so, okay, in most of these studies, people concentrate on the bacteria because the bacteria the DNA sequences are the most abundant. But on the other hand, uh, viruses also play a very important role. And we know that uh, in the human body or in many uh, different environments, the, the number of viruses is about tenfold of those uh, number of bacteria. Although the virus genome are small, but it's very, very important. It should uh, help, the, I mean, the, it's effect uh, the bacteria and then kill some of those bacteria or increase the productivity of this bacteria and so on. And it also can bring the genetic material from one bacteria to another bacteria, that's the horizontal gene transfer. And so on, so it's just control the community. And so therefore, virus play a very, very important role in all this microbial environment. But on the other hand, our knowledge about virus is widely understudied. Because one is the virus is small, and the other one is the viruses are, uh, have high mutation rate. So therefore, uh, in the NCBI database, uh, the number of viruses are sig is significantly lower than that, so the number of bacteria. And the, for people that who are just extracting these viruses, that if you do an alignment to the NCBI database, you probably get 15% to 20% of those read that can map to the uh, reference genomes. But most of them, about 80% to uh, 85 to 90% of those read, you cannot map to any of these reference genomes. So therefore, we try to study uh, those novel viruses. The other reason that we concentrate on viruses is my collaborator. And actually, my collaborator is a marine biologist, and he discovered the first marine virus in the 90s. So that's the reason that uh, not just from human, and you work on the uh, marine part, and there are some knowledge that you can transfer to the, uh, the human health and so on. So that's uh, close to, very close to Chris's vision that we look at the world, not just on one particular human health or so on. We look at the world uh, globally, and from the ocean to the earth and to the human health and so on. And then we study the sustainability. So uh, how do we study those microbiomes? Uh, the, in the different environment. And here is this uh, uh, general procedure. And we do next generation sequencing. I suppose that most of you already know the next generation sequencing essentially is we just do not do any culturing. And then we just go, OK, we just random shotgun sequencing of this whole microbiome. We get lots of lots of lots read. 
and then this read uh, depend on the different technologies. It can be short read, it can be relatively long read, and so on. And then you get all this read. So once you get this read, and then sometimes it's, uh, this read are generally short. And so what we do is we get those, uh, uh, assemble them into this context. That's definitely a lot of people are working on this assembly, this problem, and that's involved in a lot of the, uh, the expertise here that's uh, related to the computer science. So I'm not going to concentrate on this part. We start from A here. Suppose we already assembled this context, and we ask the question that uh, which of these contexts come from the virus? and which of these contexts from the host, like a bacteria, archaea, or all these different kind of microbiomes. And so then, essentially, we separate those uh, contexts into virus contexts, or those different host contexts, including bacteria, archaea, or other potential hosts. And then we study the diversity of those bacteria, as well as this diversity of the viruses, and so we have this uh, figure that you'll see how, what fraction of these uh, different bacteria or archaea are in those uh, uh, different uh, microbiomes. And similarly, we study the virus of this. And then essentially that gives us the individual things. The other thing actually is we know is viruses cannot replicate itself and it replicate by infecting the bacteria, the host. And because bacteria are the most abundant, most of those viruses infect the bacteria, although it infects some other uh, organisms. So the question is, how do we infer the host of those, uh, the, those viruses? So that we can see, oh yeah, this is, this affected the host, and then we try to see how those viruses and the bacteria affect with each other. So in that sense, we get a network, and so that's getting the expertise of this group, network science. And so now we have all this complex network, and actually they are very delicate, uh, elegant. Um, network structure here in terms of virus and the virus they also form networks because they have the, they evolved from one virus to the other virus and then they have all these different viruses and in that sense the viruses some of these viruses and they can be close together and then you have the so-called virus network and then you can study the similarity of these viruses, and you ask the question, which virus are close to another virus? And the, similarly, you can study the relationship between these bacteria, and then you see, okay, which virus, which bacteria, or which bacteria close together? And then you can study there are some relationship between the virus and the host, and then you have those uh, infectious uh, relationship, and then you see the, uh, those networks from the virus to this host, and then you also there are some relationship between the similarities between the sequences, those virus sequence and those bacterial sequence, they might uh, affect, and then they also have some kind of sequence similarity. Now essentially you get those two layer complex network one layer is those bacteria, another layer is this virus. And between them, they have this network, and then you have those two layer, very complicated network. How do we understand those biology from this complex network? I mean, that's getting to the expertise of this computer science, this biology, and so on. There are a lot of things that we can try to understand. So definitely the question becomes, how do you measure the similarity between the virus virus and the virus host and also the virus, the bacteria and the bacteria? That's just getting to that very important question about how do you compare them? And remember that those virus and the virus 
they don't have high similarity because of they evolve very, very fast. So that's some of the questions that we try to uh, study. And we use the computational tools to answer some of these questions. OK, so now let me concentrate on two questions that we have been working on for the uh, last two years. And that's just received funding from the NIH that's related to the MIDAS program, actually supported by the MIDAS program. Actually, first, we did not really uh, submit to that because uh, we did not see uh, real connection to the uh, infection disease. But it's the program officer essentially immediately recognized that, yeah, your stuff really related to infection disease. The key question is that let's say you have a new virus that's just spreading in the community, and then you don't know the sequence of this virus, and then how do you identify this new virus that's causing this infection disease? Again, that's probably getting to the very, very strong expertise of this group. And so that's uh, all these things uh, just uh, class together. And I think it's a, a, a good, com the good connection between all this work with the core work in here. OK. So we focus on two questions. Is that we first, we identify those new viruses in the metagenome. And the second question is we try to predict the host of these viruses. OK, so now let's get into the first question. And so in terms of the first question is you try to identify those viruses from those uh, mixture of those uh, um, the bacteria and the viruses. How do you do that? And so what differs from this uh, virus and the bacteria? So we need to use those kind of characteristics. And then what we all know are those virus sequences and those bacteria sequences, right? And so now that we already know a lot of those viruses, and we also know a lot of those bacteria in the NCBI database. Although the number of viruses are not that many, but we know them, right? And so then it's become a machine learning kind of a question, right? And so we have some of these samples, and then we try to do it. All these things we know are the sequences. And in the traditional uh, machine learning field, you have x1, x2, and so on for each of those uh, objects. And then here, no, you don't have that. All you have are those sequences. You need to extract those feature space. What is the correct uh, definition of this uh, uh, feature space? So, uh, so in the first question, then we try to get a simple one. And so now given a sequence, let's say you have a thousand base pair sequence, and then you know the sequence is from the virus or from bacteria. And then we try to say, OK, so now we try to define x in the machine learning field. And how do you define that? And then the natural way we do is we use cameras. And so the cameras is just for a k, let's say it's 6 or whatever, and 12 or something. And then you have this uh, segment of these cameras. And then we try to count the number of occurrences of these cameras in this sequence. And then, uh, because uh, sequence length does not really affect that much, and you might get 1,000, you might get 3,000, you don't want to use the length information. So therefore, what we try to do is try to uh, normalize it, and so that instead of just get the absolute count, we divide it by those uh, uh, turtle count, and then you get a relative frequency. And so then now you have this, and the first question you ask is, OK, so with this representation of these uh, sequences, and with the annotation whether it's a virus or the host, 
can you design a machine learning tool to study, to distinguish those virus from the host? And that's very, very standard one. So the key challenge here is you just realize this problem, and secondly, you just try to extract those features, and that's it. And so now, let's start the, the, my philosophy. It's a, if you can use a simple method to solve this problem, don't go too complicated as long as you solve the problem, and that's fine. So, okay, so that's what my students did. And so what she did is just use some standard uh, machine learning tools. And then she, here in this one is uh, she just used logistic regression with lasso uh, regularization. And uh, I hope uh, most people know this. And so, so essentially it's just uh, the number of the features is kind of huge compared to the number of learning examples. So therefore, we need to use the regularization to penalize if you use too many parameters. That's it. Okay. So now the question is, will this method work or not? And then can you, how do you validate your method to work or not? So we design the following studies. So what we did, we tried not to overlearn. That's the important part. We say, OK, so now don't look at some of the data. And then you just use something. You hide some data, and then you predict. OK, now what we did is try to simulate a real kind of situation. But we are a computational group, so we don't have experimental data. If you can have experimental data, that's perfect, but we don't. In that sense, how do you do that? And fortunately, in the NCDI-BI database, they tell you the year that the sequence was submitted. Right? And so now let's say, just a cut a year, and I'm not doing my study in 2017, and now I go back three years, and yeah, that's the time that I was doing the study. OK, so I use those data that before 2014, and I purely use that data, I learned the model. And then for those ones that predicted, uh, not predicted, that experimentally validated after 2014, and I use this to test this, whether you are OK or not. OK, so that's, again, it's quite easy, and but it's a, you need to know, yeah, in the NCBI, there is really that year there, and that's real. And so, okay, so very simple. And then we learn it. And then the question becomes, what are the effects of all these different things? And so the, how about the length of the impactor, the length of the sequence? You might have, say, the contiguous 1,000 base pairs, or 3,000 base pairs, or 5,000 base pairs and the, what, uh, what kind of lens you should use, right? And the other thing is uh, what K should you use? If you use K, let's say, equal to 2, you say, OK, so you probably don't have high power to distinguish this virus from the host, right? And so, OK, so now we want to change these two parameters. One is the length of the contig. The other one is the camera frequency. And then we try to evaluate the prediction accuracy using those uh, uh, use different parameters. OK, so then that's the result that we get. And the, as you can see here, this x-axis are the camera lens. And this, this one is the uh, ROC score that uh, Professor Reid mentioned. And I'm not giving you the. I think most people know the AUC score. And then the higher, the better. And so now, as we can see here, is that these are the different uh, camera, uh, these are the contexts. And so as you can see, if you use the camera equal to 2, the K equal to 2, you essentially don't have uh, that high how are you see? So that's just like what we uh, know. But as the K increases, 
and then those prediction accuracy become higher and higher. So that's perfectly okay, right? And that's like what we expected. But it's when actually it's we say, okay, so how about you go even higher? Let's say 10, 11, 12, and so on. And the will it become decrease or not, right? So that's a natural question. Actually, it's a, uh, if you get it too high because one is a sequence error or something like that, and then not necessarily you get too very high, it's always better. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that, yeah? And so, so you can see here that everything looks okay. It's just like what we expected. When you have the sequence length be 500, then you don't have that high prediction accuracy. And but when you get to, uh, let's say this is 1,000, and then you get 3,000, 5,000, and 10,000, you are much, much better. And everything seems to be working like what we expected. At least that shows that, uh, yeah, and your method reasonable, and then you can solve this problem. Okay, so the, then you just get this one, and uh, we see we are happy about this. The, here, the IOC score getting to, if you get to uh, 3,000, you get to around 0.96 or something, and that's quite good. Okay, so uh, now, we have, we also see it's uh, if you just, you can learn different models using 500, 1000, you can learn different models. Now in the real data, now let's see if you have uh, a thousand base pair uh, length contig. Do you use the learn model from, let's say 10,000 or from 1000? I mean, originally I was thinking, oh yeah, you should use uh, 1,000, right? I mean, that's what you expect. But it's, again, is this true or not? And you study what kind of model that you should use uh, for these different things. And so actually it's uh, this uh, kind of similar, but it's essentially that gives you the uh, different ways how do you get uh, the, by, the, you don't need to learn every sequence length. And so we essentially use three different lens models to predict the accuracy. Okay, so that's uh, everything good. And then, uh, then we compare with other existing methods. And uh, as you know, and this is the computational, we need to compare with other things. And the viral sorter is the, the current uh, so-called standard uh, good one. And so we compare them. And then we say, okay, so our method uh, compared to them is quite good. Okay. So um, the, the most important thing actually is getting to the real data. And this one actually just getting this paper to the microbial journal. Otherwise, you probably don't. Because the other method, you might get the BMC genomics, the BMC bioinformatics, but you don't get to that. But it's what we try to do is, OK, so can we use these things to really get to the real disease or not? OK. So, in the public data, we have this liver cirrhosis, and they have this public data available. And then originally they use bacteria to uh, whether you can distinguish those uh, normal healthy individuals from those liver cirrhosis patients. And so the question we ask is, is virus play an important role in the liver cirrhosis? Or in some sense we ask is, if you only use viruses, can you predict whether it's liver cirrhosis or not? So that's the question what we do. Okay, so now because we have the program that to define those new viruses or not, and then we can identify these viruses and then we do a clustering. And before we doing that, we get those viral contexts and then we get, we do the, the, the clustering of those uh, Context, and then we see, okay, this is this context probably belong to one particular organism, and then we get the uh, relative frequency of each of those virus. And so here we get around, uh, I believe it's around 150 uh, virus here. Uh, let me see. Oh uh, yeah, actually it's 116 virus uh, contexts. Okay, uh, the contact beans. That's kind of. A, like uh, the virus classification group. Okay, now we purely do a clustering, 
And then what you see here is those figure, and then you do a clustering, and then you see yeah those red ones are the uh, ones that uh, uh, have liver cirrhosis. Okay, and then the blue ones are the normal health, normal healthy individuals, and. The, yeah, you say, okay, it's not perfect. I agree with you, it's not perfect. But you can say something here, right? And you can see those uh, liver cirrhosis patients tend to group together. Okay, it's computationally not perfect, but, it's, oh, but you, you get some signal here. Okay, so that's, that's the show that we can get this. Okay, and then the other one you can see, okay, so can we predict? I mean, this is. Uh, from a computational point of view, you see, okay, that, that's that. And then you can see, it, can you predict? Now, what we, again, what we do is we try to not overlearn. That's the key uh, challenges that we do, uh, we don't overlearn. And actually, fortunately, in this, this the liver cirrhosis, we have two different data sets from the, uh, two different uh, the studies, okay? And then we learn one model from this study, and then we try to predict in the other study. Okay, so in that sense, you do not really look at your testing data. And then that's what we, we learn the model from one of these 38 liver patients and, uh, and 40 controls, and then we test it into these 330 samples. And then we purely use those virus, uh, 516 viral contexts. And then we use this again in a simple method, the logistic regression again. And then that's what we get, the uh, AUC curve. Again, remember here, this is the only independent data set. And so you can see here, if you use viral sorter, and then your AUC is around 0.77. And then those, if you use the viral find, that's what we get. And then you get it 0.87. And so for those of you who know the uh, field of the IOC, and then you can see get from 0.77 to 0.87 is not easy. I mean, that's clearly show that our method really uh, help to get it. So that's also push our uh, paper to a high uh, impact journal. Then you get to the BMC by informatics. Okay, I'm not saying BMC by informatics is not good. I, it's good. Okay. 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 So that's the first story, and that's the virus. And then now the second question is, uh, how do you infer the host of the virus? Now you predicted this is a virus contact, and in many situations you really don't know the host of this contact. And so, which bacteria this virus will affect? Okay, so now what is the information we should use to predict the host of this virus? As a mathematician, I don't know. And so, and then that question actually is proposed from my collaborator, Jed Furman. And he already started this virus host interaction. And so he, other people say, okay, so the, because the virus affect the host, and then the, the virus use those replication mechanisms of the host, and so they should have a similar kind of camera frequency. Okay, again, we use camera. Okay, so that's what they try to do. And then they did, what they did is they use the, um, they try to calculate the camera frequency for the bacteria and the camera frequency for the virus, and then you can do like Euclidean or Manhattan distance, and then see if this idea will work or not. Right? That's simple. Okay. So that's what they did, and then what we, what I mean we, I mean Mike Watman and myself have been working on the sequence comparison alignment free stuff. That's the D two star stuff. For, for many years. That's the one that we, we did. And we started from 2009. And then actually, at the whole project, I suppose Mike probably briefly mentioned about this uh, a few weeks ago. And so the whole project from 
Mike's uh, purely mathematical interest. He, he doesn't uh, care about uh, whether it's applicable or not. And that's Mike's style, okay? And so, I mean, a lot of the stuff actually is uh, purely scientific curiosity. I, I think it's Chris share this vision. It's uh, you don't have to be, at first you don't have to be really that practical and do something that you find interesting. Okay, so the story comes is Mike was interested in the, um, the so-called D2 uh, similarity. Actually, it was developed by uh, David Tony and uh, it, uh, a former close friend, I, I think a friend of Chris. I mean, a lot of the people here know David Tony. Okay, so we are all connected and David Tony offered me a, a postdoc position in 95. So. So we are family in some sense. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so David Tony essentially just proposed that uh, if you calculate the camera and you just calculate the N uh, collected uh, correlation, uh, then you just see, oh yeah, these two sequences are similar or not. Okay, so I mean, it's a, it had some impact, okay? And so, but on the other hand, there are some real biological applications give you contradicting result. And then, okay, so then it's not popular anymore because people say this is not uh, realistic. And then so that's David uh, proposed it around the 1990, okay. And then, uh, that's 10 years past and nobody cares and uh, it's faster and it's, it's useful, I, I would say. And so, but in around 2000, uh, and then uh, Mike just, uh, okay, so, because the statistics is really simple, that's the so-called D2, and then he studied the mathematical properties of this D2. It just, okay, so this is simple. And I just uh, studied what is the distribution of this D2. And then he proved mathematically, this D2 actually is, uh, the variance is, a large of this variance is the uh, deviation from the itself. The variance is really you have the camera count and then it's, it has its variance among the individual sequence and it's, it's affected to some extent by the relationship between the two sequences, but it's more related to the variation in the single sequence. So then that's from mathematically proved that is not a good statistic in some situations. Okay, then, then at that paper, he said, okay, so what we should do is to just minus background, okay. So let me see if I, I give you uh, a, okay. So this is, suppose you have this uh, sequence, actually it's not from next generation sequencing data at that time, and you just think it's a long sequence. What we do is to minus some called background. What do we mean by the minus background? And each sequence itself has its own underlying some called microchip. chain. Okay, I'm probably going to too mathematical, I hope, but uh, you don't mind. And so you have the Markov chain, and then that determines those sequence. Most of those sequence follow a Markov chain. Okay, and some of them, because of selection, is being overrepresented or underrepresented. So what you compare it's not what you have the count of this camera frequency, but you want to see the over or under representation of this word. So therefore, what he suggested is you minus those expected count. So that's how we do it, and you minus the expected count. And then you compare these two instead of the original and then you do some kind of normalization, and that's what we, uh, you, we have this, and then we have this uh, statistic. 
And then this is just some kind of normalization. Again, this is what I proposed that uh, you normalize this expected count. And then uh, for this one, actually, this is Gesina Reinet from Oxford University that she proposed. And again, this is from some uh, the mathematics, uh, Larry Sharper from uh, um, uh, Berkeley Statistics Department. And he said that if you have two normal distribution, and then if you do this transformation, it's still normal. And so that's why uh, Gesina Reinet proposed this one. So then we say, okay, so we sh mathematically show these two statistics actually uh, more powerful than uh, the original D2. Okay, so that's it. So it's from mathematics, actually. Okay, so uh, Mike is a revolutionary guy. I'm not, okay? And so, but I can try to see it's whether those uh, stuff really, really useful in the real world. And the mic say, okay, I don't care. Okay, so, <laughs> so but, I mean, but biologists care, right? right? And the real world care. And we want to see if you really want to push this, will this work or not in the real world? And since then, I have been pushing this to uh, many different problems. And then we just applied to, to classification of the, let's say, the uh, vertebrate organisms and the uh, classification of these tree species. And then we also uh, studied the virus host interaction. And the one interesting story I would like to share with you is when I give this talk uh, in IH, some industry people say, okay, so you said you can classify these individuals. And now illegal logging is a very, very important problem in the world. And so if I give you the DNA sequence of this tree, can you identify where this tree come from? Okay, and now suppose you already get a, a group of sample real sequences and you do sequence comparison. And actually these statistics that we recently come out is just amazing. I wouldn't share with you, but you can, you can believe me, we can completely separate those European trees from those North American trees. And he does not believe it because he tried many different methods that he could not do it. And our method can do it. Okay, okay so that's getting too far from what I'm doing now. And so, so, okay, so now you have this uh, statistics and then we also get some theory about how do you really determine the order of this Markov chains. And now let me say it's just uh, getting back to what I'm trying to say, the virus host interaction. And because the uh, Jed Furman, my collaborator, they already have this training data. They, they have the real interaction and then random one, you can put that. And then you just immediately, my, uh, the, once he told us this one, because he had this training data, my students, uh, uh, Jane, and then um, she just did it in the one afternoon, because it's already, we have the data already. And so this is from the uh, Euclid distance. And the, if you have the real interaction, the real interactions, and then the Euclid distance is the, the histogram of the Euclid distance is here. And the, the, for this, are the, the open bars are the random pairs. And then you can see here, yes, they are signal even for the Euclid distance, right? Because the Euclid distance for the real pairs are stochastically smaller than those uh, random pairs. Okay, so now let's do the same thing for those our distance matter D2 star. And what you get? Yes, and that is the figure that we get. And I don't need to explain to you, and once we see this figure, yes, there is a paper there, right? Because you can see clearly that, yeah, I mean, computationally, you still have overlap. I mean, we computationally, we never if you just completely separate, I believe something is wrong. But it's, you can see this figure 
that this one is much separate, much, much better than this one, right? And so here you have this one, and that's, yeah, we immediately see just one talk, and then, yeah, one afternoon, uh, my students carry out this and draw this histogram, and then, yes, we have a paper. And so now, once we have this, and then we can also just see if you use this, this distance measure and try to predict if it's smaller, then you predict the uh, infection, otherwise you don't predict the infection, and what kind of uh, ROC curve you get. And this here is the ROC curve. And so for our D2 star, and you get the AUC equal to 0.89. For the Euclid distance, you get the AUC equal to 0.76. Very simple, and you get it. But it, to write the paper, you know, it's not simple. That's another half a year to just see, okay, so this is good, and from this way, that way, and so on, and that's finally, uh, we finish this in half a year, and that's publishing an NAR. Okay, so I, I mean, again, I, I don't have time to show this, and just believe me, and this is amazing stuff, and we don't believe it, but that essentially shows that those D2 stars really, really give you a good result. Okay, so and, and as you can see here, is we have uh, many, many applications, and then uh, we see this is a, a good method, and uh, we actually, I just uh, finish one review paper for the annual, for the new, Journal of uh, Annual Review of Biological Data Sciences, and so uh, if any of you would like to know the, the most recent review, and then uh, send me an email, or I can send it to Christine to share with you guys, and your comments are greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you so much for all your attention. So I don't know if we have time to. <laughs> uh, Gigi. Uh, so I, I observed that uh, in, the, in your expectation, you have to eat up all so for, so, so for two sets of uh, sequences, you have different e expectation. Yes. So, so are you, so can you describe like in general, what type of Markov uh, Markov modeling are you using, and it is, is it depends on the camera? So when you see this camera, what's the probability of seeing the next one, or it's just a nucleotide level? If you see an A, what is the probability of seeing U or G? Oh, it, actually, it, this K mm. is something different from the original background uh, sequence. And so, uh, if you are given, let's see, if you think about the long sequence, mm -hmm. and then you try to say, okay, so you assume this model, this one is a Markov chain, uh -huh. and then you say, okay, so what is the order of this Markov chain? That's actually the uh, most important uh -huh. part. And there are some, a lot of theory about uh, those one, and that's uh, using the Akira information content or the BSA information content, and so we say that's already there, and so you can use the BSA information to get the order of this Markov chain, uh -huh. and then you, you minus the background. Okay. And for the next generation sequencing data, then Jesse's paper on the bioinformatics paper tells us how do you uh, get the background uh, Markov model. Actually, it's a very beautiful uh, mathematics paper, actually. It's, uh, you can think about the two layer stochastic process. One layer is the Markov chain, and then you have this Markov chain, and then another layer is this uh, lambda volume model for the uh, sampling of the read, and this uh, uh, you can think it's just a Poisson process for the random sampling of the read, and then you have these two stochastic process. Now, what kind of statistical problems you can infer from those generated by now? You all you know are the short read, and can you study the statistical properties of this original Markov chain? It's a very beautiful uh, mathematical problem. Okay, so for the software, we have many softwares, and I think this one also, the, I, I, I don't, don't mind, you can put it on your website for the whole slide, so yeah, they are, I don't have time to talk about other algorithms. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Kim.